Hi everyone and welcome to the first guest event for the LGS Biology Society. Today we have a special guest with us. She's a genome biologist, director of the MRC Human Genetics Unit and was president of the Genetics Society for five years. Professor Wendy Bigmore was also awarded a CBE in the New Year Honours for her amazing work in biomedical sciences as well as her dedication to helping women in science. We're very lucky to have her here to discuss her journey through school, university, and to give us an insight into the sort of groundbreaking research that she's been involved in. Professor Bigmore, thank you for joining us. It's a real pleasure to be with you this evening. Nice to see so many of you interested in biology. <laughs> so I guess the best place to start would be where your in initial interest in science really sparked. and. So what would you say was the first thing that really got you interested in science when you were a child? Um, I think it was definitely gardening. So both my parents were very keen gardeners. Ne neither of them had any formal education. Um, they both left school when they were 14 or 16. Um, uh, but they loved gardening. And I, I remember being taught by my dad about um, apical dominance, how if you pitch, pinch the top out of a, a plant, you can make it, the side shoots sprout out of flower. And he had, even though he had no formal education, he had some understanding of what the mechanism was that led to that. So definitely, definitely it was plants. And, and, and I too love gardening. It's one of my passions. Um, and one of the things I did uh, when I was president of the Genetic Society, it was our centenary year. Um, and we decided to celebrate it by taking uh, a show to the Chelsea Flower Show and trying to show some of the principles of genetics using flowering plants. So de definitely it starts with plants, which is a bit ironic since I now work in human genetics. But <laughs> I, you know, I, I would also love to work in plant genetics. It's just as fascinating. And uh, would you also believe that your biology teacher or your chemistry teacher also had a big influence? on you and your interest in science? Yeah, I, I was incredibly lucky to have fantastic science teachers. Um, I'm sure you have as well. They, they made all the difference. They made it so exciting. Just, I just, I, I loved school and I loved learning with them. They clearly had a passion for the subject. So de definitely, and particularly my biology teacher really inspired us. Um, I know you mentioned gardening, but was there something that particularly led to your interest in biochemistry, like a particular book or an article? Um, I know you read something called The, the Chemistry of Life by Stephen yeah. Rose. Yeah, I, I recommend you read it as well. It's, it's a great book. Yeah, so when I was in um, my last years at school, I thought I wanted to go and do medicine and become a doctor. So that was what, what was in my mind. Um, and I, I had a summer job. Uh, in a canteen uh, and I happened to be, I, I had with me a paperback book written by Stephen Rose called The Chemistry of Life, um, which explained, and, and I was amazed that you could start to explain biological systems and living systems through the principles of chemistry. And, and at that time in, in the biology school curriculum, there wasn't that much kind of biochemistry in it. It was much more um, kind of, you know, ta taxonomy and that and uh, anatomy and physiology. So it was quite an eye opener to me that you could understand biology and medicine and disease uh, at that level of atoms and molecules and reactions. Because I did also love chemistry as well, so it must have sparked off something in me. So I decided to drop the idea of doing medicine and decided to apply to do biochemistry instead, uh, which I loved. I had no regrets about doing that. It's a great subject. So I didn't actually study genetics at all. <laughs> I'm also really interested in studying biochemistry at university and you kind of covered this but I want to know what your reasons were for studying biochemistry at Oxford. Um, it, 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 uh, it excited me the course because it, it did contain a lot of chemistry actually. A lot of the first year was doing organic chemistry. So I, I really wanted the chance to really get a deep understanding of molecular reactions uh, at that kind of level. So that's what really attracted me to the course there. And of course, the, the fantastic departments that were around and the people that you could work with on, on projects and things like that. So yeah, it, it was a terrific course and still remains so, I think. 
Um, yeah, so after you graduated from uh, Oxford and you did a PhD uh, at the University of Edinburgh um, about nuclei, nuclei acid sequences of the Y chromosomes, could you tell us um, how, could you tell us what doing a PhD is like? Yeah, sure. I'll, t I'll tell you first why I ended up doing that PhD, uh, which is completely unscientific. So, so when I was at university, I, I used to I used to hang out uh, a lot with with mountain climbers. So we used to spend our summer holidays in Scotland, walking and climbing in the mountains. So when I decided I wanted to do a PhD, my criteria was I just wanted to go to Scotland. I didn't really care what the PhD was on. And, and this was happened to be the one that I was offered <laughs> and, and I took it. And it, it, well, it turned out to be a one, wonderful choice, obviously. Um, and, and it was it wasn't really biochemistry, but that didn't bother me. Um, the project I did at university for my biochemistry degree took me, started to take me into chromosomes and genetics. So it was a it was quite a natural progression. Uh, yeah, so I decided to study chromosome evolution in primates, how the sex chromosomes, the X and the Y chromosome have evolved uh, in going from chimpanzees and gorillas to to humans. Because there's been you know, the sex chromosomes are very interesting because they behave so differently in meiosis from the autosomes. Uh, and there's been some interesting exchanges of material between the X and the Y over that evolutionary time. So that was what I, I studied. Uh, and I studied it in a wonderful MRC unit called the Mammalian Genome Unit, which was led by Professor Ed Southern at the time, who was famous for discovering, well, naming the Southern blot. So one of the very first people to start to study the genome and, de and develop the technologies. He, he also developed a lot of the technology that today is used um, in DNA sequencing and, and other ways to investigate the genome. So it was it was an amazingly fertile uh, environment. So yeah, and, and it is it's such a change going from a university to doing a PhD because in university, although you of course get to do some have some laboratory experience, it's all pre-planned for yeah. you. You know, here's the experiment, you follow this, and and you'll and you and you'll look at the results. A PhD is completely different because it's all, it all it's all down to you. You discuss an idea, a question, you talk about ways in which you could address that question, but then it's up to you to really go off and make that question fly, to do the experiments, to work out why they don't work, to troubleshoot them, to take the answers you get and use those to develop the next question. So you really learn self-motivation, I think, uh, and quite a lot of resilience about, you know, how to pick yourself up when things don't work because they often don't work uh, and you just have to pick yourself up and, and do it again. Um, I think one of the key characteristics you need to be a PhD student is to be really stubborn and say I'm going to make this work, <laughs> I'm not going to give in. Um, so it, it's a bit daunting in a way but also a fantastic adventure because it's completely down to you and, and you have quite a lot of freedom to go off in different directions. <clears throat> Although you may decide on the first day, you know, what your question is and your experiment's going to be, over the course of three years, of course, you, you do a bit of a random walk and, and, you know, and your results take you off in a completely new direction. And that's great, and you can just do that and follow it. So you really become in charge of your own intellectual curiosity. Yeah, wait, so, were there like any unexpected benefits that came along your way uh, during the research? Uh, <clears throat> well, technology was changing while I was doing the research, so I really benefited from being at that time when the real breakthroughs in genome biology were being um, made, when the new technologies were being developed to, to sequence and analyse the genome. So I definitely feel that I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, but hopefully, you know, took advantage of that, definitely. The, the very first thing I was sent to do when I was a PH, uh, as a PhD student was I was told to go to the zoo and get some blood out of my cats, which I wasn't expecting. <laughs> That's my first task. So that was a bit daunting to have to roll, roll, roll up at Edinburgh Zoo with a couple of tubes in my hand <laughs> and say, can I have some blood, some female and male macaques, please? Yeah. Um, so, um, so what kind of technology did you use um, in the research, and like, what new technologies did you, if if you had any, did you manage to use? I I, I um yeah I used 
I, I did a lot of cloning. So cloning bits of the of chimpanzee, gorilla, macaque, human genomes in, into bacterial vectors so that I could isolate them, sequence them, understand them. Um, so very different from science as it is today because it was all manual. You did everything with your hands. Now it's all machines and robots. And, you know, um, it was very, very it's, it's, it was, it's a craft. You know, you had to be able to do things well with your hands. Um, but, at, but at, at that time, there were new forms of gel electrophoresis being invented that allowed you to separate and analyze bigger and bigger stretches of the genome. Previous methods had only allowed you to, to look at a few thousands of bases at a time. And then suddenly we were able to look at millions of bases at a time. So really start to think bigger than small bits of the genome, think about whole chromosomes. I think that was the big, the big change. It was really the start of chromosome biology as opposed to just molecular biology. Well, doing your PhD, you had the chance to work with two great geneticists, uh, Howard Cook and Sir Adrian Bird. Uh, how was your time working with they, them and what kind of things did you know? Oh, they, they were they were both fun, very different from each other. So I was I was Howard's first PhD student, so he didn't know how to supervise a PhD student. <laughs> so he kind of left me to my own devices. Um, in, in fact, the first the pretty much the first few weeks I showed up, he said, oh, by the way, I'm going to America to do a sabbatical. See you in a year's time. <laughs> <It's> like, <"Whoop." laughs> so, yeah, that really taught me to stand on my own two feet. Um, of course, I was surrounded by wonderful colleagues who helped me. Uh, so you're never alone. Um, Howard was uh, also a trained chemist. So he he really took pride in how to do experiments. And, and, and really knew lots of tricks and shortcuts about how to do things. He was also incredibly messy. Often his results weren't very beautiful at all, but he had this insight in being able to see what was an interesting result uh, and what wasn't. Uh, that, I think that was a real skill that Howard taught me. Adrian was quite a different scientist, I would say. He's, he's very meticulous, incredibly deep thinker. So, so Howard would just have an idea, start an experiment, see what happened. Adrian would always think, is this a good question? Is this the best way to do it? And it would spend a lot of time doing it. I mean, both equal, you know, there's not one way to do science. And that's one of the things I like about it. It can accommodate all kinds of personalities to, from the kind of obsessive person who's really interested in detail to someone who's much more big picture. So, and so it's quite interesting to see those two different scientists develop their own, make their own fantastic discoveries. Uh, Adrian was also very funny and self-deprecating and, and still is today. Actually, he still works in Edinburgh. Howard is now retired. After your PhD, when you did your postdoctoral training at the Lister Institute of Preventative Medicine, you began looking at the structure, of organ structure and organisation of chromosomes in the nucleus. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit about what you found from your research? Yeah, so um, when I started my postdoctoral period, I began studying um, how human chromosomes can become rearranged in certain human genetic diseases. So I became interested in this kind of large scale organization of our genome. Um, first of all, in, in two dimensions along the length of the chromosome, that was the first work I did. Uh, and I discovered uh, a really interesting pattern in the way that genes are organized on chromosomes. And then that led me to thinking, well, well what happens to that inside the cell then? How does the cell deal, deal with this, with our genome and this pattern? And I, I often think, why did I think that? Why was I the first piece person to ask that question? And I think it's, I'm, I'm, I like, I like jigsaws and paintings and things like that. I think I'm a very visual person and I think I like map reading and things. I think I think in 3D a lot. And so that caused me to say, well, how is our genome? Our genome, you know, we, we normally think of the human genome as a computer printout. It's a bunch of letters on a page. But of course, that's not the way it is. It's a three dimensional object. 
And so I, I devised ways to actually look at it using uh, imaging microscopy, um, using fluorescent colours to ask how different parts of the genome are arranged in the nucleus. I think most people thought they were probably just random. You know, you just the genome was just stuffed in this bag inside the middle of the cells. And I discovered actually it wasn't. And there's actually a three dimensional arrangement that seems related to the way that our genes and genome work. And that it was it doesn't happen very often in science, but it was a real eureka moment. Uh, that's one of the things about microscopy, I think, because you look down the microscope and there's such a, there was such an obvious pattern there. I just went, oh, my God, <laughs> this is so obvious. What's you know, this result is so obvious. I don't need a ruler or a measure or anything to get the data out. I can see it with my eyes that there's a pattern there. Your, your eyes are great pattern recognition tools. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of that discovery. It's in the textbooks now. And so, so what I actually found was that I, I already knew from my earlier work that uh, genes are not distributed evenly between our different our, our different chromosomes, between uh, the autosomes and sex chromosomes, and that some of our chromosomes, particularly chromosome 13, 18 and 21, are very sparsely populated with genes. And of course, these are the three human, uh, human chromosomes which we see, you can see as live births, uh, uh, with trisomies 13, 18, uh, 18 and 21, the 21 course being Down syndrome. But you can also see trisomy 13 and 18, which are uh, very devastating disorders. The children don't live very long. But you'll never see a live birth, for example, of trisomy 19 because the, the embryos and fetuses will die before birth. So that the, the organisation I saw and the organisation of the genes and the genome really explained why, for example, trisomy 21 is uh, viable because actually it's a very small chromosome anyway, and it's just got a very low density of genes on it. So the excess copy of genes is not as many as if um, you had three copies of chromosome 19, for example. And I found these gene poor chromosomes, 13, uh, 18, and 21, uh, are located around the outside edge of the nucleus, and all the gene rich chromosomes are in the middle. So this is kind of radial organization of our genome. So um, you, you did the research on the positioning of the human chromosomes in the nucleus. Um, did it help explain normal cause, causes of behaviour in the cell? It, it, it helped to explain or at least get people to ask the question of, of how do we control the way genes work in the cell? You know, we, we have 20,000 genes a lot of non-coding DNA in there as well. How does the cell work out which gene to express at the right time and the right place in our tissues and during development? And, and, and to this day, that's the work that my lab does. We're really trying to understand how you control gene expression. Uh, and, we, and we think it's part of it is related to the three dimensional organization, because one of the, the really fundamental things that came out of the human genome sequencing project was the realization that we, we actually don't have that many more genes than a fruit fly has. I think everyone was a bit disappointed. They assumed that humans being more co complex organisms would have tenfold more genes than a fly. That turned out not to be the case. <coughs> we have almost exactly the same. So it's, it's really not complexity comes not from what genes you have, but how you control them and how you use them. So what we do that flies do to a much lesser extent is have very exquisite control of wh which genes are switched on when and where uh, in development and in biology. And, and one of the remarkable things that, that is the focus of my work at the moment is asking how does that happen? How do you switch genes on? And it turns out it's done by bits of the genome that aren't genes themselves, then they're in the non-coding part of the genome. We call these elements enhancers, they're like switches that turn genes on. Um, at very particular times and places. And most and remarkable what, what I find remarkable is these switches can be located <clears throat> an incredibly long way away from the genes that they control, <clears throat> up to a million base pairs away. Which seem, it seems like a mad way to organize the genome. But that's the way it's evolved. And I'm trying to understand how that works and whether the way the genome is folded up in three dimensions rather than just the linear distance is important to that control. So do the switches and the genes 
come close to each other in real space, in three dimensional space. Oh, that is very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it amazes me that our yeah. biology relies on this mechanism of, of, of bits of DNA so far away. And that it works yeah. so beautifully. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned that your lab is focusing on the organisation of the nucleus and how it influences the genome in development and disease. Has there been any or what have you found from your research? Have you found anything surprising or interesting? Yeah, so there's a there's a there's a controversy in my field at the moment about how this long range gene regulation works. Some people think, yeah, you really have to curve the genome over so that the enhancer and the gene come together in order for them to work. Uh, and others suggest that's not the case. Uh, and, and, and indeed, some of the work that I've done suggests it's not that simple idea is not completely true. Uh, and so we're trying to work out, well, what is the communication that occurs between a piece of DNA a million base pairs away and the gene that it's going to turn on? So one of the um, most fundamental advances, I think, has been made in, in, in our field, not by me, but by others in the field in the last few years, is that actually our genome is organised into little compartments each about a million base pairs long. Um, they're called TADs, topologically associated domains, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but they're made by this machinery. Uh, it's a, mo a molecular motor called cohesin that's moving up and down our genome all the time. Um, and it helps to create these about one megabase size blocks, structural blocks. Uh, and these seem to correspond to the regulatory domains. So there's this correlation between these domains and long range regulation. And people would, and of course you would like to think that because they're correlated, one might cause the other. There might be a causal link between TADs and gene regulation. But actually you've got to go further than making a correlation these days. You have to devise experiments where you perturb the system and I ask what happens. So we want to be able to perturb TADs this compartmentalization of our genome and perturb the molecular motor that makes them and ask what happens to gene expression. Um, so that's what we're doing at the moment. It's, it's more difficult when you think because these are essential mechanisms for the cell. So you just can't just take them away because organisms die. They're, they're vital for life. So you have to do more subtle things experimentally, like uh, just take them away at the very last moment uh, as a cell changes its cell fate, for example. Um, and we're using a new a new method at the moment. It goes back to, to plants again, actually. Um, it, it's taking um, the ability of auxin to degrade, auxin, the plant hormone, to degrade particular proteins. So we've, we've got, sorry about that. Uh, we've, so people have taken um, this domain from plant proteins um, and added and shown that if you put that into human cells, you can get you can add orcs in the plant hormone to these cells and it helps to degrade the protein that you stuck this onto. Yeah. So we're able to stick this domain onto the end of the, the molecular machine cohesin. Add the plant hormone orcs into the cells and within a few hours. The compartmentalization disappears, the cohesive motor disappears. We can destroy all these structures and now ask immediately what happened to gene expression. So it's this ability to really use chemicals to very quickly change genome organization and structure that's really exciting me at the moment. And we also develop, we're also developing new tools to turn genes on artificially. So my lab is moving into an area called synthetic biology where rather than relying on normal developments um, to um, change cells, watch them change fate um, through the endogenous machinery of the cell, we actually build our own control circuits to turn genes on because then, then that gives us real control over what's happening. So now we're, we're coupling this degradation system on the one hand with our ability to artificially turn a specific gene on at will with, with synthetic biology tools. And I think this is really exciting me in my lab at the moment. I think this gives us the real control over the complexity of a cell that we need to really understand mechanism. So, but so bi I mean, biology is changing so fast at the moment, 
driven through technologies. The, the other crazy thing we're doing is do we, we're going to rewrite a whole section of the human genome. So rather than you know, change a G1 gene, change a base here, we're just going to completely re redesign a whole topologically associated domain, a whole regulatory area of the human genome. So um, you could do that using gene editing tools, one, one place at a time, take you forever. Um, but what you can actually do is we, we've taken a bit of the human genome, we've moved it into yeast, budding yeast. Um, and there we know that there, we have the tools in budding yeast to completely synthetically rewrite long stretches of the genome. So we can use the, the yeast to completely rewrite that portion of the human genome and ask questions like, what well, does it matter if the switch is over there on the left hand side? What happens if we move it to the right? What happens if we move it closer? What happens if we put two switches together? What happens if we change the, or the order or the orientation of the gene? We can do all that, rewrite it all in yeast. And then the challenge is to move that bit, back, bit of the human genome back at, that we've rewritten back out of the yeast back into a mammalian cell to test whether it still works or not. So again, this is that, you know, it's the next level of synthetic biology where we really under, understand the design principles of life by redesigning them ourselves to test our ideas. So I'm doing that um, in collaboration with a group in New York, at the New York Genome Center, who um, published some papers last year where they completely redesigned the yeast genome. They made, they called it, um, so the yeast, the budding yeast is called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, and they, so the, the name of their re-engineered yeast is, is, they call it Saccharomyces cerevisiae 2, because but it's a completely synthetic, artificially written version of the yeast genome. So it, it's quite mind-blowing and very exciting. Um, as a strong ambassador for women in science, how much change have you seen in the genetics of biochemistry industry to do with the attitude towards women? Yeah, it, it's, it's changed an awful lot. I think when I was a PhD student, there were a few women group leaders around. I mean, it wasn't that there were none, but there weren't very many. Um, but now that is changing. It's changing very slowly, I have to say. Um, but it's changing. Most of our PhD students now are female. Also at the postdoctoral level, there's a good proportion of uh, uh, women postdoctoral uh, scientists as well. At the next level up, at group leader level, that's when the dropout starts to happen. And of course, that, that tends to happen around the, the time that women start having families. And I think they make the decisions at that point that perhaps they don't want to be leading the whole group where you're responsible for everything, raising the money, supervising everybody, publishing everything. Um, it can become quite demanding. But it is a very it's a very flexible career because you're your own boss. So you, know, you can decide when you do the work as long as you do it. It doesn't matter when you do it. It's not nine to five. So you, you, know, you can work it around other, other obligations and, and things are changing fast. And I think the funders realise that they have to change some of their attitudes as well, and they become much more flexible uh, in the way that they fund science. So it used to be, for example, if you wanted to move from being a postdoc to running your own group, to becoming a group leader, you would be expected to move, certainly within the country, preferably within, you know, between countries. It used to be said you couldn't become a group leader unless you'd gone to America for a bit. That's completely changed now because people realise not you know people have got other obligations. They can't just up sticks and move across the world, um, you know, depending on what their family circumstances are. So that attitude has changed, for example. So you know, people can stay in the same city uh, and develop their careers now in a way that they couldn't before. So it, it's changing, but slowly, I would say. You know, the, the proportion of women professors in UK academia is still too low, but we will get there. I know you've kind of answered this a little bit, but could you tell us a little bit more about the climate you were working in um, in your day and how you think that might differ to today's? Yeah, um, I think it, the whole science has become much more professionalised. I think when I was a student, it was it was almost like doing a hobby. Um, and 
I don't think any of us ever asked what we were going to do next in our career. We never we never really thought about a career actually. We just were kind of doing what we wanted to do and we would see what happened next happens next. Uh, and there weren't really formal training programs in place. That's completely changed now. So our, our PhD students, for, exa for example, they have, as well as their own experiments, they also we also give them a formalized training program to train them in transferable skills, how to give a talk, how to write, how to communicate, how to manage data, how to interact with industry. So they have a much more rounded uh, experience than, than, than I did. I hope they still have fun doing their experiments. Uh, and certainly that idea of professionalising everything has spread throughout the, the whole system. And, and that, I think, makes it more transparent as well. As a woman who wants to pursue science myself, it's really inspiring to talk to you. So I wanted to ask what sort of things you did to get young women involved in science and if you had any ideas for us what we could do in school. Yeah, I, well, I, I do think it's about role models, actually, and just showing you can do it and giving people confidence. I think um, if I look at myself as a PhD student, I had no confidence the first year. You know, every time I made a mistake, I thought I was stupid. And you just need people around you to support you um, and, 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 and say, you know, it's OK to make mistakes. It's OK to get things wrong. You can do this. Um, so, yeah, I, I really I think it's it's. You know, you can put big national scale programs in place, but I think the encouragement really has to be person to person. So finding good mentors is really important. I think people can help you through difficult times. People who've been through it yourself. So I, I, I think in terms of women in science, that's what I've tried to focus on, you know, being being an example, being a mentor, spending time with, with people, helping them through difficult you know, we all, we have you, know, you have to have a thick skin if you're a scientist, you know, because it's lovely to get your papers published, but often you don't. They get rejected and you get reviewers saying nasty things about your experiments. And that can be a bit. And also when you're applying for grants, if you don't get them, you know, and you, you get feedback that says that wasn't very good or very interesting, it could be tough to take. Um, you get used to it eventually. But, but having colleagues around you who can support you and say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, this happens to everybody. Uh, why don't you look at it this way? Yeah, so it, it support networks really important. And I, I've always tried to promote the women in my institute, make sure that they're invited to give talks at national conferences, international conferences, make sure they're 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 visible. Thank you. You can't be shy of retiring and being a scientist. You have to promote yourself. <laughs>